Hi, I'm Jonathan Jay, and welcome to Dealmakers TV, where I meet and interview professional dealmakers, people who buy businesses for a living, and professional advisors, people who should be part of your business buying deal team. I want to show you the tactics and the strategies, the tips and the tricks that will make your next acquisition successful. Today, I'm talking to Kelly Bater, who helps me get the people part of an acquisition right. Now, this can be a minefield, and Kelly helps me avoid tripping up. So, welcome, Kelly. So, first of all, here's the, the tough question <laughs> to start off with. Are the people in a business that you buy the greatest asset or the greatest liability? Good question. Well, they should be the greatest asset but quite often they are the biggest liability. Yeah, yeah. so it's a little, little, <laughs> bit of, little bit of both. Yes. Now, you know from working on acquisitions with me that sometimes you've got to make some tough decisions and sometimes you buy a business that's overstaffed and the yeah. only way of saving that business is to trim down the, the staffing. So how do we get that part of it right without it blowing up in our face from day one? Well, there are po uh, processes to follow um, and it's about mapping out that processes, but there's also time scales. Um, there's time scales that you've got to achieve your overhead savings potentially, um, but there's time scales that you need to stick to dependent on numbers that you're working with um, that you'd have to follow and achieve as part of the process also. So lots of my clients buy businesses that um, have, have seen better days and quite often what's happened is that the, the revenue, the sales revenue has gone down but the overhead, which is typically mm. the staffing, has remained the same and, and that's really what's caused the problem. So the new owner needs to make those tough decisions about who to keep and, and, and maybe who to, to let go quite early on. Yep. Um, what can go wrong if you don't get that right? Well, it can be very costly. Um, if you don't look at your figures and, and the people that you've got and the terms and conditions that they're on, perhaps prior to the purchase, um, you, you, you could end up with huge wage bills. And if you don't get the processes right, um, huge costs at tribunal, for example. Okay, um, and you know, you've seen me get this wrong when I've been doing it by myself and you see me get it right when you've been helping me. And, and I know that in the past we've always looked at all of the staff prior to an acquisition in order to ascertain really you know, who's being paid what, their length of service, what else is important? Well, you'd look at the benefits that they're on. Um, you, have they got company cars? Are they, have they been purchased by the company or are they on lease? Um, if you've got a lease, how long is the lease for? Because you could be potentially stuck with a 24 month lease. Um, so there's a, that's a cost that perhaps you wouldn't be looking at um, if you're just looking at the people's wages. Um, what terms and conditions, notice periods, for example, are they on six month notice periods or is it a one month? Um, the six month can be quite costly. We've had for a you. few of those, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so I often um, encounter a situation where someone comes to me and says that the previous owner had promised them a bonus, and you know, you're, sometimes you're not sure because there's, no, there's nothing in writing. How do you deal with that? Yeah. So obviously, you have if a bon if things are said in uh, verbally, then it, they can be contractual. Um, so we need to understand if there is a bonus clause in the contracts or any kind of policy or um, anything around bonuses, see what the wording is. Um, hopefully they are um, discretionary or not guaranteed, dependent on company performance, etc. With fingers crossed we've got something like that. Um, but ideally you need it in writing you'd want them to be able to demonstrate that. So, so, so if, if this employee came to us and said, I'm, I'm owed this bonus and there's nothing in writing, mm -hmm. uh, does the new owner have an obligation to pay that bonus? Because, you know, if we were being cynical, we could say that maybe there's a, uh, you know, we take that with a pinch of salt. Yeah, um, so the, no, there isn't. Um, obviously there's things we'd have to look at, but uh, there wouldn't be an obligation to pay, right. to pay the bonus. Okay, so let's say, um, I'm, I'm just thinking of one particular client that I'm working with at the moment who's just bought a business that is massively overstaffed for the reasons that we said earlier. Um, you know, turnovers 
dipped, but the staffings remain mm. the same. And he's got to let about 25 people go in this business just to save it. Otherwise, he won't be able to save the jobs of the other, the other 75 or 80 yeah. people. So how do we go about doing that? Um, we would we'd look at the, uh, the structure of the of the people that we not the people the structure of the organisation, um, where is the work um, at the moment? Where, who's needed? What positions are needed to fulfil the mm -hmm. needs of the business? Um, and we then have to do a uh, we would we'll do a review of who's uh, length for services, salaries, yes. etc. So the usual uh, due diligence when you're looking at the redundancy side of things um, and then work out a plan of action. It's time scales. What are we looking at time scales? Um, there's various ways. Redundancy is not always the answer. Um, there okay. are routes before redundancy or you've even got voluntary redundancy where people can volunteer to go. We did that once, didn't we? We did, yes. yes. Yeah. 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 And, and that was very successful because mm. people feel in control of their own future exactly. and they're not being dismissed or you know they're not being got rid of yeah you know, it's their very, choice it's their choice yes. yeah and, and and in my experience there's always a percentage of people in any company are thinking of moving on anyway um so in actual fact you're helping those people make the decision that they were going to make regardless yeah usually it's per it can be perfect timing for people and quite often they don't realize it's perfect timing until afterwards mm. and they say actually it was the push that i needed and they actually they volunteered for it so it definitely works yeah and, and and again in our experience they actually thank you <laughs> for helping them make that decision yes yeah so it, because I, I, I know, again, from working with business owners who, who want to buy other businesses, that their biggest concern is, if I buy a business with 20 staff, 100 staff, 500 staff, is this going to give me an absolute nightmare of people just queuing up outside my door, knocking on the door and saying, I've got a problem with this, a problem with that, I've got a grievance over this. And I always say to people, first of all, you shouldn't be in that location to start off with. You should have a, a manager managing yeah. it. You shouldn't be there personally. But how do we help? How do we help people overcome that that anxiety that buying a business with lots of people is just going to create lots of headaches? I think any business that's got employees, you, you're going to have issues or challenges, as we call them. Um, and there's part and parcel. I wouldn't see it as a, a, a blocker to buying a business or a major issue. Um, it's, you've got the right people working with you that can deal with those um, situations, questions, queries, whatever it may be. It's, it shouldn't be feared. I think you can gain yeah. trust yes. actually. So if you've got the right people in place, and even if you are visible on, at the premises when you first mm -hmm. um, take over the business, it's building that trust. Uh, with the staff, even if you are going through a redundancy process, if they they respect you a little bit more. Yes, and, and, and what I've found is that if you are, are, are straight right from the front and uh, mm. right from the beginning, and you say um, we we will have to make some cuts, and you're probably wondering if your if your job is is safe, um, we have to e examine this to to save the business and we will be informing everyone in the next 24 hours. People like that certainty of knowing when a decision is going to be made, don't they? They do, and uh, yeah, people want things to happen to quick, quick, quickly. If there's yeah. going to be bad news, they want it now. I mean, in previous lives, I've worked in large organisations where redundancy process has taken six months, right. nine months, yeah. and it's just agonising for the individuals because they're waiting Yes. to find out if they've got a job and it could be going on for six months. Do they look for another job? Will they have the security? You know, yeah. They've got what, families. What do I do? Exactly. Yes. So, um, you know, they, whilst you, you may think that you're doing the right thing, you're probably not. And quite often get people that would say, can we just cut the process short? Any, because I just want to know. Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, again, I know from personal experience is that people actually thank you for not keeping them hanging on. Mm -hmm. They want to know exactly where they stand. They want a swift outcome. They want a fair outcome. 
Yes. Um, another concern that I know that uh, the people that I work with who are buying businesses have is that if they have to make some redundancies, where's that redundancy money going to going to come from? Mm. So are there any creative ways of, of allowing us to make sure that everyone's paid every penny that they're owed, but it doesn't kill the company in the process? Yeah, so it is possible to stage uh, the payments. Mm -hmm. um, so if somebody is entitled to three months notice, for example, um, you, you're not going to make them work that three months, not mm -hmm. necessarily. You can, but you may not. Um, but you may say, and part of the conversation with that individual is, look, you know the situation. We're, we're, we're in this situation because of financial um, yes. reasons. We'd like to make those payments over three months um, which is no different to what they would have got exactly. if they continued working anyway. Exactly. If There's they worked no... out their notice, they'd have got it over three months. Yes, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's no different. It's just because if you've got that one big chunk of money coming out in one month. Yes. That's, that's not Well, anything. I mean, I, I had this with, with the one that, uh, that we worked on with you where the executive team's salaries were so huge yeah. and they were all on six months notice yes. that I think it was in the region of about £250,000 plus the NI if we'd exited them all together mm. on the same day, which was always going to be the plan, but we paid them over six months, they were happy and we had the benefit of being able to spread that quarter of a million pounds over a six month period, which then was paid for out of the cash flow of the company. Yeah, and it, and they still got their money. Mm -hmm. um, and there was, but the, the key point is you had the money to pay them. I mean, yes. if you'd had to make these large sums, um, these payments in one lump. Yeah, it would have hurt. It would have hurt and, yeah. you know, the staff that were remaining may not have got paid because you were- Absolutely. Yes, you're right. Mm. So you have, to, you have to make a judgment call and, and really do the best for everyone involved, Everybody. the company and the and the individuals. Yeah. Yeah. So let's move on to talking about um, the different ways of buying a business. So you can buy the, the shares, you can buy the, the assets, but in both cases, you get the staff, don't you? And this is the, the 2P regulations, yes. which again, strikes fear into the heart <laughs> of many business owners. Uh, and they shudder when they, they consider the, the obligations of 2P. But I've never actually had that concern, possibly because I know, because I've worked with you, that if you deal with it correctly, mm. it's nothing to be concerned about. So just explain, would you, for everyone watching, how 2P works? Yeah, so 2P is the uh, Transfer of Undertakings Protection of Employment Regulations. And the idea is that when a um, company or a provision of a service transfers from one ownership to another or to another company, the employees that are assigned to that provision of service or company transfer over to the new. Um, and they transfer with their existing terms and conditions. So it's been around uh, 80, in, since the 1980s and it's right. to protect um, you know, employees' terms and conditions when a company's sold or if a, con a new contractor is going to supply a service under a contract. Yes. So uh, if you're buying the assets, um, which is a, a very smart way of, of buying a business because you're buying assets rather than assets and liabilities, which is what happens when you yeah. when you buy shares, uh, the staff still come with you. They're protected under the same contract. If you have no intention of changing the terms and conditions, especially uh, at that point of transfer, then it, it is quite simply a letter, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it, there's, there's a consultation um, if you've got time. Uh, some of these acquisitions happen quite quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, others that you've got quite, quite a bit of time. Um, the, the company who the, the staff are leaving, um, they will be consulting with their staff to let them know what's going on and that their um, uh, employment is transferring. And at that point, the company who's taken the start who they're transferring over to should be getting involved and saying, hi, this is us, everything's okay, you're transferring to us. Okay, let me just interrupt you there because yeah. I've got a couple of acquisitions happening right now that are, that are asset purchases. Mm -hmm. And it's very important that confidentiality is maintained because it's a reasonably yes. fragile customer base. So consultations with staff in advance of mm -hmm. our acquisition is just not feasible no. because it would destroy the value in the business and therefore we wouldn't want to buy it. So actually a consultation would impede the, the transaction yep. from, from occurring. So how do we deal with that? Because we don't want to do anything that's outside of, of what 
is legally correct, but also we want to make the tr make sure the transaction is successful. So what would you suggest we do there? So that would be on the day of the purchase. Um, it could be a letter to say, hi, we're the new owners and you've transferred over to us. It could be attending the office or the site or wherever it is um, to say, hi, we're your new owners. Um, it's, it's communication. Chief is really about communication as well okay. as the um, the transfer of their terms and conditions. And I suppose the communication has helped if you're not changing the terms and conditions and you can assure everyone everything carries on as usual. They still get paid at the end of the month. It would just come from a different bank account. Yeah. And, and I think that probably settles people down, doesn't it? That does, yes, yeah. Um, part of the consultation, if you are changing terms and conditions, then you, you're, the consultation is there for you to tell them actually on, after the transfer, this will be changing. That'll be changing whether it's location or you, you can change their terms and conditions, but it's communicating that you're changing those. So as you know, in our private client group, we uh, one part of the program is teaching our business owners in the group how to buy a business from an administrator. Now, obviously, there are different stages of buying a business from an administrator, whether it's some sort of prepack arrangement or, or whether it's just the, the assets that, that, that are being liquidated. So what happens with the staff then? Because quite often the staff has started to disperse anyway. Um, and if you're going to buy the, the assets, you know, maybe it's some machinery or something, do you get the staff then? Because I, I know there's a, there's a, there's a yeah. couple of key distinctions and we always want to make it very, very clear to our clients the, the correct way and the best way of doing things. So what would you suggest? Yeah, so up until the point of, uh, prior to the company going into administration, if you do the purchase before then, then the TUPI applies. Yes. Um, if you um, purchase after the company goes into administration, then TUPI doesn't necessarily apply. Okay, so explain necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is the grey area, isn't it? Yes, in most cases it won't, um, but it, it could be that it, each case um, would serve on its own merit, to be honest, we'd look at it individually, but in most cases, TUPI wouldn't apply. So is there some sort of test to ascertain whether the staff are inherited, for want of a better mm -hmm. word, or whether they are not? How, how, do, how do we ascertain? Yeah, it's, it, I, w I would say if it's after administration, TUPI doesn't apply. Okay. Yeah. That's, okay. the, that's but, the safer. But, yeah, mm. but if you did want to take on yes, the staff, yeah. and in mm -hmm. some cases that's exactly what you want to do, yeah. then of course you're entitled to do so, or at least offer them employment with a new company. Yeah, and you could you could offer say to them, we want to take you on the same terms and conditions, mm -hmm. um, and you could just transfer as if it was under Tupi, or you could offer to employ them on your new your your company contract okay. terms and conditions so let's say you want to change the terms and conditions mm -hmm. so that, again for the benefit of people watching this who maybe have not done this before what what are these terms and conditions that we keep talking about so it's uh, whatever's in the contract of employment so it's their location mm -hmm. um, their rate of pay their uh, job titles who they're reporting to uh, if your bonus is contractual, then it'd be bonus. Um, sick pay, holiday pay. Um, hours of work. Out, yeah, hours of work, exactly. If you offer any enhanced payments, so on maternity, paternity. Right. Sick, uh, if you offer. So, uh, in actual fact, every clause in an employment contract can be renegotiated, yeah. and, and that is what changing their terms and conditions is. Yes. Okay, yeah. interesting, mm. interesting. So, let's say um, we're buying a business. Uh, we have, um, uh, we're buying a solvent business. We've uh, tupied over the, the, the staff. The staff are still, still there in situ. And some of them don't like the fact that they've got a new boss. Mm. Is that an issue or am I just uh, imagining something that isn't really a problem? Um, it's, it isn't a problem that you just want to manage it. There's no, a lot of people don't like change. So this is true. They, they could be doing exactly the same job in exactly the same location, same pay, everything, but it's the change that they don't like. Yes. So it's, it's managing that situation. Um, you know, they've, they've got a job, they've transferred. Yep, absolutely. Um, it's if you're communicating right, 
So what we always do is we make sure that the the previous owner is seen to pass the baton on to us, yeah. and it's a it's a happy situation. We buy a you know bouquet of flowers for the uh, for for the exiting owner and, and and some sort of gift, a bottle of champagne. So it's so it's seen as a very positive move rather than a hostile takeover. Yeah, yeah, um, and it's it's all for the greater good. It, yeah. Things are only going to improve. Future investment into exactly. the business. Yes. We're going to expand the product range. You know, it's all that, yeah. all that, uh, that positive stuff. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah. So sometimes we have situations where we're buying a business. Again, I can think of one that we're doing right at the moment, where there is a family member employed by the company. Now, in an ideal world, we don't really want a family member to be there no. because we bought the company. We are going to start doing things our way. And typically you meet some resistance from family members because when mum and dad were the boss, yeah. it was uh, yeah, it was it was all very easy. They could they could come into the office anytime they wanted. No one told them really what to do because their parents yep. were, were, were the employers. <laughs> and that's gonna change. So how would someone deal with a situation like that? Mm. Um, so sometimes you'd have an agreement before you purchase the company that actually the, the family are not part of the purchase and they, mm -hmm. they resign or, or whatever they do so that they, they don't come over with the company. If they do, I mean, by all means, try to work with them. If you, you They may well have the valuable experience, yes. knowledge, everything that you, that you need. Um, it's just building that relationship and, and um, I guess, moulding them into what you're looking for but other times it just doesn't work yeah I mean, um, but my preference is always a clean exit yeah. and you know have, having the, um, the the sons the daughters the cousins the daughters-in-law the sons-in-law still involved feels like you're not creating a distance with the past and actually it, it confuses the employees they're not entirely sure who to, who yes. to answer to anymore do they do it the old way or do, do they do it the new way yeah and they they the person, the family member still acts like they're the one that's in charge. And Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And comes in at half past nine, even though they're meant to start at nine <laughs> o'clock. Yeah. And takes a long lunch break and all of all mm. of those things. Mm. So the clean break is, is what you're looking for. Um, but that would be in the form of a settlement agreement, usually. Yes. Um, so, so, a, so would you explain what a settlement agreement yes. is? So it's a, a mutual agreement to leave the company with a payment basically, um, with no comeback. Um, to, they, they sign a legal document um, yes. with a solicitor, um, which confirms and they agree that they will not make any claims to tribunal. Um, so you know that they won't come out of the woodwork three months later yep. with some unfair dismissal claim, some bonus commission claim. You know that it's, it's done and dusted. Yeah end of mm -hmm. and of course that payment can be their last month's salary yeah it doesn't have to be an additional payment does it no it doesn't it's a payment or, or am i that's, being mean <laughs> it's a payment that that's agreed between the pair of sure you. um a solicitor would probably advise them that they should be going for what the equivalent to their redundancy um right, payment of course plus well, their notice to, uh, plus yeah. their notice period and if they're six months yeah but again that's always negotiable isn't it yeah, uh, it is. Yeah, because the settlement agreement is a negotiable um, contract. Yes. And um, we teach a lot of negotiating skills on the programme. And this is one of the areas where business owners don't realise that there is a negotiation skill required mm. because you know, sometimes with a six month notif no no notice period, which is typically for the people on the larger salaries anyway that might be 50 60 thousand mm. pounds and in actual fact if you can negotiate that down to a one-off payment today of 25 thousand pounds you've saved yourself and the company a lot of money yeah exactly and the the, the time that it take it could take to agree one of these um, contracts add, it's adding money every day so it's a quick conversation yes um, get them to a solicitor very quickly can you can i tell you how i do it i actually get the settlement agreement signed as part of the completion mechanics so the owners let's say mum and dad can't sell the business to us until the son has signed the settlement agreement so actually it's them putting the pressure on the son to say look 
yeah, yeah. stop messing around. Let's get this signed because we can't go on the um, the world cruise <laughs> until you've signed this settlement agreement because without the settlement agreement, we can't sign the sale and purchase agreement. So therefore, the pressure doesn't have to come from us. The pressure is placed upon the vendors of the business to, to, to make that happen. Perfect way, yeah. And if you've got the, if the it's, good, it's good leverage, isn't it? Definitely, yes. Yeah, yeah. highly recommend that. <laughs> so, what are the other pitfalls that people need to look out for? You to buy a business. You've got all these people that you've never met before. Um, what other things should we be concerned about? Um, the, uh, the say the sh the structure of the business, the levels of um, if you've got management, you know what they, their capabilities. I'd be looking. Uh, at um, those areas. Mean? So line management capabilities, leadership, I'd be looking at those uh, because you've, you have you may well go through this very quick redundancy process, settlement conversations, mm -hmm. whatever it is, and then you're left with a team that may not have the skills that you... Here's the thing. What if someone is being paid to do a certain job and they are clearly not competent mm -hmm. performing that job what recourse does the, the new owner of that business have? Uh, there's a couple of routes that you can take. You've got the longer routes and then you've got the shorter routes. So I'll start with the shorter routes. If it's really not working and you don't think it's going to work, then again, the settlement agreement um, is a conversation and to make a clean break, mm -hmm. exit them from the business and put somebody else in. Or you can go down the performance or capability route where it's you're stipulating where you want them to be, what you want them to be achieving by particular dates. And it could be a win-win because they may actually get to the point where you want them to be. Which actually is really a great outcome, isn't yes, it? Because it hasn't cost you any more and, and maybe someone just needs to up their game hmm. or they didn't realise really what they had to do and how they had to do it. Exactly, yeah. And now they could be getting that structure that they've needed this whole time and it's a, it's a win-win for everybody and if they don't achieve what they you want them to be achieving then you you can ultimately exit you can move them on so either way it works you either have a, a, yeah. a member of staff who performs better or you have a member of staff that you gave a second chance to didn't really measure up and they move on so you don't have them dragging the business back exactly yeah very interesting <laughs> so how do people get hold of you if well, they would require your assistance. And I would strongly suggest that people do get HR support when buying a business because there are so many things that can go wrong with the people. Yes. Doing it all by yourself is, and, and you know that when I've done it by myself, that's when it messes up, which is why I work with you. <laughs> so how do people get hold of you, Kelly? Sure, they can get hold of me um, via my email, uh, which is kelly at kbetahr.com. Um, I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, I think that's it for now. Everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm all over social media, so they can get hold of me anyway. Yep. Kelly Bater, thank you very much. Thank you. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and tap the notification bell so that you get an alert every time we upload a new video like this one. And also subscribe to my Business Buying Strategies podcast on iTunes. It is the most popular podcast in the world on buying a business. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.